Hola, comadres. Welcome to the 11th episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. This is our first episode after our baby hiatus for the holiday season. I hope you guys had an amazing holiday. And what better way to come back than bringing on my following guests? We have an illustrious guest today, and her name is Gri, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, Marcy. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to just be a part of this um, passion project and this beautiful podcast that you've birthed. So um, my name is Griselda, Griselda. I accept both. Um, I am a mother, a wife. I am a professor of international um, and gender studies for the City College of New York. Um, I am a birth doula. I've been a birth doula for almost 10 years. And with my twin sister, Miguelina, uh, we are the Brujas of Brooklyn. It's a collective wellness platform where we focus um, our work of wellness on addressing womb imbalances among women of color. All right. Um, and then for the listeners, the way I know Gri, it's it's so funny. The world is so small. I started <laughs> following Miguel when you guys did a curly event with Ada. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was wow. Like, I don't even know. Like, that was like, I want to say like 2016. 17. That was four years ago. Yeah. yeah. So like 2007. Maybe we knew each other before then. But I, like, I, I clearly remember I was supposed to go to that event. I was actually traveling out. I didn't get to go. Um, but then I followed all the people that were on the panel and I followed Miguel. And I started, you know, listening to you guys. And, and eventually you guys created a series of cord cutting ceremonies. I didn't get to go to like the first um, set of three, but then I ended up going to the other ones. We actually saw each other there and we started talking and then I reconnected with a friend of mine from childhood, Erica, who, um, is actually, we're from the same town and we grew up together, but we had lost contact. So it just like literally came like full circle. And then after that, like, you know, we're just on and off going to things together and we're running the same circles. So today's topic is very interesting and I feel strongly about, um, we already kind of talked about it in a previous episode and it's the importance of self-care as a mother and a woman. And we're also going to talk about healing and shadow work because this is a lot of the work that I did when I was with you girls um, mm -hmm. in the in the workshops that we did. So the reason why the topic came up is that some of some of the people uh, we talked we actually referred to it in the episode with Penny and um, Double D's dating and divorce, and then a lot of people asked me how I healed from all the trauma and all the things that I went through, you know post-divorce and all the things that I brought into that relationship. So I feel like it's something that needs to be discussed and, and womb health is something that I'm, you know, very passionate about as well. So we're going to start off the conversation with this. Why is self-care important? And I know this is a big question. Oh, it's such a timely question too, because, um, at least when we're recording this, right, um, Bell Hooks passed away. And for those that today, for those that don't know, um, Bell Hooks was an author, an activist, a Black U.S. woman from the South whose work, I mean, I think Bell Hooks has over 40 books, um, really touched me and so many other women of color because of her emphasis on self-care as a revolutionary act. And the reason for it is because I think it's it's the obvious first that if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. It's that proverbial example of when the oxygen mask comes down, God forbid, if you're in a situation in an airplane where it's needed, they always tell you adults put on your mask first and then you could put on the child's mask because you have to be sane and stable in order to help someone who is helpless to a certain extent, which is a child. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the more obvious reason why self-care is important. But then when you put um, certain things into context, like being, being women, being Latinas, being black women, being immigrants or children of immigrants, whatever intersection your, your life or identities lie in, 
it makes it even more important because we come from people that were brutalized and whose bodies were treated inhumanely for the sake of, of profit and wealth building within white supremacy. And that's even more reason why for women and women of color in particular, self-care is key. I also think that self-care as mothers is very important because we give and give and give. As women, generally speaking, we tend to naturally give and be givers. But when we're a mother, that mental load is no joke. Just the laundry list of things that we're constantly micromanaging and thinking about mm -hmm. that just adds to our load and our need to take care of ourselves. And also lastly, because we grew up, at least I'll speak for myself and you to a certain extent, we grew up with mothers that were immigrants to a new country who didn't know or didn't have the privilege to take care of themselves. So I, 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 place self-care in the center of doing it for me and doing it for the many women in my family that weren't able to do so. That's amazing. I want to touch on some, sorry, I want to touch on something that you talked about. And, um, you know, I do see it as a privilege, you know, being able to self-care because our parents weren't afforded that luxury. You know, I feel like it's a luxury, but it's a necessary luxury. And it's not like it's a luxury, like I'm gonna buy myself a Louis bag, you know? It's self-care is essential. Right. There's no way, like I, we've talked about this before, me and you, and I also discussed it on the on the show that you can't pour from an empty cup. Right. If your cup is, is depleted, there's no way that you can give 100% of yourself if you're not, you know, doing the things to refill that cup. So, you know, Things as simple as, you know, just just taking time to rest. Taking time to rest is like something so simple, but our parents weren't afforded that luxury when, you know, when they were here and making it and trying to, you know, raise this, these families. You know, we have beautiful families, but our moms, um, desafortunadamente, unfortunately, they had to sacrifice themselves a lot. And, you know, I, I talked about this, like, La imagen, the image of la madre abnegada, like the, this sacri this mother that's just constantly sacrificing for her children and doing, you know, and not really thinking about themselves to the point that they make themselves sick or ill. You know, um, with that being said, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, the self-sacrificing mother. This is one of the things that my mother and I bump heads the most about after becoming a mother. My son is seven, is that she doesn't really understand how I can still, you know, when the world was open pre-COVID and even during COVID, like go out or go on overnight trips and leave my son overnight or for a few days with his father or with her you know, grandmother or even with my twin sister to do something that for her wasn't urgent. She was like, yo nada mala dejaba ustedes si era una necesidad. I will only leave you all talking about my twin sister and I overnight with someone if it was like I had to work or it was an emergency. So I've had to teach my mother also herself while I'm doing it for myself to reconfigure her understanding um, about what motherhood is and that that self-sacrificing mother is not going to work for anybody because then we become burned out as mothers. And then oftentimes, sadly, which I know for a fact happened to me, the mothers end up taking it out on the children because they're just so utterly burnt out yes. and a little piece of them subconsciously could, could even believe that it's because of the children that she's so burned out, which we know is not true. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we're, we're getting to a better place where my mother still believes that once a woman becomes a mother, there's just a lot that she's, that's not acceptable for her to do anymore. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's been a journey teaching my mom as well. This is the thing, like, I remember when Aiden first got diagnosed, you know, I really like took that role to heart. I was not leaving Aiden with anybody. You know, I was like staying home with them and it it like started taking a toll on my mental health. And then I'm sure I decided like when his dad and I finally, you know, went through court for custody and all that. Um, and we set up the visitation. I took advantage and I went out with my friends and did things that a typical 20 year old did. And my mom was, you know, didn't understand, 
you know, she was judging me and she was like, you know, I never went on and I didn't do this um, unless it was, you know, necessary or, you know, and, and that doesn't, that, that is not, that type of mothering doesn't work for me because I, I can't be a hundred percent there for my kid and give him the things that he needs if I'm not giving myself the things that I need. Right. So I wanted Absolutely. to ask you before before we started recording, you said that you went and got a massage today. So I, mm -hmm. with that same vein and, and using this as a segue, what does self care look like for you? Yes, girl, self care is oof is a is a whole list of things from you know the obvious like getting massages, hot bubble baths. Um, getting pampered, like going to the spa, getting a manicure and a pedicure. Um, Self-care also, you mentioned it earlier, means resting when I need to, like asking for help, asking my husband, my sister, my mother for support if I feel like I need extra help. Self-care to me is spending quality time with my girlfriends, laughing, dancing, going out, going to trips. Mm -hmm. Self-care also for me is... Sometimes just carving out a day or a few hours in the day where I just don't do nothing. And that can mean binge watching a show, eating the foods that, you know, I crave, but I don't eat on a regular. Just doing things that help me to disconnect my mind from the constant mental load. And the most important aspect for me about self-care is guilt, right? Is doing these things without guilt because it's otra cosa. Like we can go get a massage. We can go get a pedicure. We can unplug and sleep in until for mothers, for some of us, sleeping in is nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, but nevertheless, it's still more rest than we mm -hmm. usually get, but um, with a lot of guilt. So self-care is doing things for yourself without letting guilt like riddle you with 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 a sense of like just negativity that you can't even be present to to what you're indulging in another thing that i used to go through is like you know i wouldn't have the guilt in the moment i'd be having fun you know i'm out with my girls i'm getting the massage i'm going out for a pedicure and a manicure but then when i came back you know el tumba nota. like my mother would be like and, and I know she's listening to the podcast, but she's not <laughs> like that anymore. But she would be like, oh, Marcia, how can you leave your child this amount of hours in, in the sitter? And I'm just like, why not? Like, it's something that's necessary. And and then the thing in working with that guilt, because let me tell you something, being raised Catholic, guilt is all we oh know. You know what I'm saying? Oh my guilt God. is all we know. So from little girls, it's like, and then and then you're just like kind of left like I feel bad for enjoying myself. Yeah. And it shouldn't be that way, you know? Um so I wanted to move on to the, the next part is why is it important to balance between all the roles we play as women? Why? I didn't hear the last part. Why is it important to balance, to have a balance between all the roles we play as women? Girl, because if we didn't, we would lose our minds. <laughs> like, for real. For real, for real. Like, it's it's most, it's, it's, it's all women just because of our socialization and patriarchy that tells us that we're not enough, but then we have to be everything for everyone those mixed messages really get to us. But I think when you add on the layer of being a mother, it's like that shit gets uh, convoluted. It's almost like it gets on steroids where we have to be present for our children. We have to be present to our mates. We have to be fully present to our jobs. And then if, if we have a relationship with parents or they are helping, our parents are helping us raise the child, you have to be present to their needs. And psychologically, it can be a huge drain. And then we live in a culture where, you know, in a developed world, my husband just sent me something today to state that in the developed world, meaning like the U.S., most of Europe, Canada, Australia, the U.S. is the only country that doesn't have a federally mandated maternity leave. You know, a private employer could give you maternity leave or a public employer could give you unpaid leave where your job is guaranteed, but you're not, you don't get paid for six weeks. So what does that tell us? That there's not much care 
or concerned for motherhood. And then you, on top of that, feeling the strain of wanting, needing to be all these things for everybody, mm -hmm. it can really, really, really get to your mental health. I mean, I have mommy friends that are working through breast issues, thyroid issues, mm -hmm. stomach issues. I mean, all these things that physiologically are an indication that we're just carrying more than our bodies are are telling us that they're phys phys physically capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So literally, it is a matter of survival and about being able to live long and healthy lives, mm -hmm. why it's so important for, for us to just manage these different identities and really take care of ourselves. Yeah, it, it really is. I, I, I It just... You know, at one point, you know, it, it's, you know, as we were growing up, I really thought that that model that we saw was it, you know, after you get married and you have children, your life is basically your children, because that's what I saw. And, you know, being around mothers like you and other mothers that I know, Sandy, you know, I realized that being in balance is essential to being able mm. to really thrive and, and succeed and to be true to yourself as well. Cause you know, we come here with a divine purpose and, and yes, mm. motherhood, I'm sure is something that we pick out, you know, in the Kashik records, we're like, yep, I'm going to be a mom. Um, <laughs> you know, we elect people that are going to be in our lives, but you know, that's not all we're here for. There's, there's like a the mm. sense of purpose and, an alignment that we need to find and you know being in balance helps you find that alignment within yourself so i feel like it's it's, it's like literally essential and and it does reflect in the body i know you've done a lot of work with queen of Hua and um you know it presents like like you said like in phys physiological issues like illness in the body if you are out of balance. So it's important to, you know, do the work to to get yourself back in balance and to, you know, keep be cognizant of the fact that we can't be all things to all people if we don't take care of ourselves. So Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I wanted to say that I, I want to acknowledge you for doing something that you may not realize, but it's a very big step is when you when you said and you affirmed that we're, we we came to be more than mothers, right? And that's big. I felt that. Like, I felt that in my heart, in my womb, because I know that that's a long time coming, knowing that you and I have similar backgrounds, being Dominican, you know, raised by Dominican mothers, and knowing Erica, the friend that we share in common, knowing that you're from where she's from, Erica and I resonate a lot because we have a lot of like nuances and with our mothers that we can identify with a lot more than our other friends because mm -hmm. generally speaking, our mothers are like more campesina, you know, yeah. papa, to un for folks to understand. So for you to say that, right, is is very big, and I'm with you, and that's one thing that is is been very. It was challenging for me to accept that that was a reality that my body was feeling. And it took years to voice that, yeah, I'm more than a mother. I mean, something as simple as if I go over my mother's house and, and there's food and I serve myself first and I eat and then I serve my son after, she's like, que tu hace? She's like, no, you serve him first, make sure he's good, and then you serve yourself. And I'm like, mom, but I am so hungry that I can't concentrate and I can't focus. He says he's okay. Let me eat to be sustained. Mm -hmm. And then if, cause I know my child is picky, so he's going to want me to make him an egg or he's going to want me to make him a ro blanco cause he doesn't want the moro, whatever it is. I know that I'm going to be tasked to do something to feed him. So let me take care of him, of myself first. And that's something that still my mother doesn't understand. Like how can I eat while my son is starving? He's not starving, but that's my mother being dramatic. Yeah. It, 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 eso también. And I thought you were going to go into like, serving your husband first before yourself. So it's like the kids and the husband. And that is very taboo. I, I remember, I want to share an anecdote. So in El Campo, we're, we're from Jima Riva La Vega, which shout out to Jima, Lo Jimero, whatever. So in the Campo <laughs> is like, literally, they just got paved streets the other day. Like it's Campo Campo. Well, it's a little town now. 
but it's rural. It's very rural. So back in the day, people don't visit usually a la doce because a la doce is when everybody's having, din- well, lunch. But it's not lunch. It's actually like like dinner. You're having rice beans and whatever, you know, like the main course of the day. So nobody used to go visit around that time, right? Because it's, it's the poverty, you know, people, they do work, but they make enough for their own family. They're not making extra for other people. So when Visita used to come over and if they happened to come over at 12, they would take the food from the kids, like la carne, para darse la la visita, yeah. they would give it to the, to the Visita. So you know, it, it, it's the dichotomy is real crazy because, like, you know, you want to feed these adults that are strangers because you want to look good. But then again, like, right. if you're a mom, you need to sacrifice yourself and not eat because you have to feed your kid or your husband. So we had this thing, me and Miguel, we tell the story that in my family, I think up until maybe our late teens, early 20s, we would have family events. And it was like the dynamic was that the women would be like in the kitchen cooking or prepping the food. And the men would be off to the side playing dominoes and drinking. And then, like, the kids and the teens would be somewhere embullándose, you know, t- tending to themselves. And then when it was time to eat, it was like the women will serve the men. Either the wives will serve their husbands or, like, I didn't grow up with my father. So I didn't really see that growing up. But, like, my mother would just start serving plates for, like, random men. Then the children would eat and then the women would eat. And I, it didn't happen overnight, but slowly but surely, my sister were very, my sister and I were very pivotal in making this happen within our family. We were like, no, no, no puede ser that you all spend the afternoon or the evening, you know, sweating over a stove to cook and then y'all gonna be the last to eat. So now it's a free for all. It's like, Todo el mundazo se va para y se va a servir eh, ellos mismos. You're just going to get up and you're going to serve your own food. And that was really, that was challenging for a lot of the men in my family that literally never had to get up from the dining room table because not only did their wives or mothers, right, because DR culture being machista is also very enabling for men or their sisters serve them, but to the uh, to the extent that like, and I know you know this, Marcy, just because campo culture tends to be more traditional than if yeah. you grew up in a more urban setting. A, a, a plate for the rice, a plate for the beans, a plate oh, for the so meat, a plate for the salad. So... It took a while for the men in my family to finally come to terms like, oh, if I don't get my ass up to serve myself, I ain't going to eat. There's still some men that the women just Mm -hmm. insist on serving them. But generally, the culture of my family has changed. And I think that that is what my immigration does. It does help us to change and shift the power dynamics so that women, especially mothers, are not on on the losing end of this dynamic like we've tended to be. Yeah, I, I wanted to touch on that too because I feel like my family has changed, you know, at least... Sorry, there's a airplane going back. <laughs> it's New York City. It's New York City. <laughs> so at least um, the dynamic here has changed, but we've influenced the, the aunts there as well. Ah. So over here, when we get together and we do like the Christmas stuff, you know, we're kind of like, yo, get up or you're not going to eat, you know? And, and, and still there's some men that... Si vamos a una fiesta de gente que no son de la familia, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. ¿Cómo puedes servir un plato de comida? And I'm like, I'm like, tú no te puedes parar. Tú tienes dos brazos que están funcionando. Y luego se me dio vergüenza. I'm like, all right, fine. Pero eh, en ese instante, pero en, en realidad, like in, in reality, what we do is, is what you guys have been doing. Like basically breaking them in and teaching them like, hey, if you don't get up, you're not going to eat. And then, um, especially because it's a free for all. Now the women, if the husbands don't go, they take out the plate after everybody ate. They let everybody eat first. And then whatever's left over, because they decided not to come to the party, they don't get the best meat or food. <laughs> so that's on you. <laughs> you don't want to go, you're not going to get fed. You, like, a ti te toca la espalda. You get the back <laughs> of the chicken because... <laughs> you... <El pichiri. laughs> Even though, you know, for my, you know, being that maybe because my family's campo, like my, my, and it's they interesting how this has traveled over my cousins of our generation. They fight over the la, la patica, like the, the chicken yeah, foot. Yo, yeah. they'd be like, I got dibs. I got dibs on it. And I'm like, oh girl, you good. You got it. That's yours. But like, <laughs> 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 
Wait, what is it? My friend called it. Wait, my friend Wandy's. I used to work with him at the bank, and he used to call it. What is it? Piquipala. <laughs> Piquipala. Yeah, that's like, that's like you know, that's that's the the stuff that like slave masters wouldn't eat, but like the neck, the epichiri, the butt, the gizzards, la patica. My brother talked about that the other day, and I was like, yo, like I hadn't thought about it in that context, and it's true. He's like. My grandma doesn't like pechuga. She won't eat. Like, she doesn't like the mulo. She doesn't like pechuga. She doesn't like any of the, like, the meaty parts. She likes all that. Like, the lo hueso. And lo hueso, right? So, Albert's like, Eso son cosa que ustedes tienen de la trauma de, de, de la clavitud. This is trauma you guys are carrying from sla slavery. And I'm like, He's like, yeah, like they didn't get to eat the good parts yeah. of, the, of the of the of the animal. They got to eat whatever the masters didn't eat. And I was like, yo, it's true. So they they this is still tradition. Like they still fight over that stuff. Like they make a sancocho and they're like, ¿Dónde está la patica? <laughs> ¿Dónde te cocote? Yo pichiri, ¿dónde quedó? Uh. I'm like, I'm good. I'm at my family. Just feels like me and Miguel are like so gringa because i'm like oh dame la pechuga dame la pechuga um, but yeah my, my mother does not like breast she does not understand why i like breast her favorite part of the chicken is the mulo but my family is, is a big gagina um eating family like they rather eat gagina than but you know i think going back to the conversation about just these norms like my husband's african-american so he grew up very americanized obviously and then his mother you know, was was ahead of her times with regards to just like thinking around gender roles and what my husband was expected to do or allowed to do. So I think that being with him has been very helpful because it's also helped me to liberate myself because sometimes he'd be like, chill. Like I'd be like, I can cocina, I can limpiar, I gotta do laundry. And he's like, like, you rest, you relax, you know, and I think that that has helped me because I'm gonna be honest with you. This is this is um, and and I hope when Miguel ends up hearing this, this is a big like back and forth that me and Miguel get, get into because I tell her like my first boyfriend of six years was Dominican, and then I've been with my husband now twenty years. You know, I tell her like I don't know if something were to happen between me and my husband if I were to be able to date a Dominican man, and I know that that's fucked up because I'm making a generalization, but. Because I feel like no matter how open-minded or Americanized as they they can be, sometimes that training and that socialization, you know, is very hard to come by. But then I know that that's not fair because we've also been socialized to think that motherhood has to be self-sacrificing mm -hmm. and we're working to do away with it. You know, but I will say that my commitment to self-care, I'll speak generally, has been relatively easier because my husband is more Americanized and he supports that. You know, and I and I don't and I see that not being the case sometimes with some of my friends that are with more specifically Dominican men because they're still rooted in the idea that like yes, a woman has to show up and be everything for the family, and if she's not, you're not seeing vergüenza. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So you know my story. I was married to a Dominican person, and I shared this in a couple of episodes ago, like Dominican, Dominican from over there, and a lot of the arguments we had was like he would tell me no pueden haber dos gallo un gallinero right there can't be two cocks in the, in the house and um it was because i'm a very i have a very strong personality not that i was like not taking care of my responsibilities as a wife and a mother but because there were certain things that he expected that i was just kind of like you can take care of yourself you're a big boy so you know, after I ended the relationship with him, I, I, I really steered very clear of Dominican men. The person I'm dating now is not Dominican and is very kind of like your husband, like very um in tune with like self-care and all that and, and, and giving me a break and respecting the fact that I am a mother and respecting my time and my space as well. So I, I definitely want to. I don't know. I'm, even though I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock the couple of men that I do know that are doing the work to heal and are changing the expectations for Dominican men. I want to give a shout out to my brothers who have, even though my mom has tried to like ingrain that kind of like Dominican Dominicanness in them, they still fight her. Like there's there's holidays that 
they come over and she's like, tú no le vas a servir a tu hermano. And they're like, mommy, we got it. Nosotros no podemos servir solo. Wow. Right? And then my compadre, who is such an empath and like so, this amazing person, he he's just, you know, th those are some of the exceptions to the rule. I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that are standing out right now. But Yes, and I, and I, and I want to echo a lot of that because I don't want what I just finished saying to come off as like, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> Dr. You know, Griselda from the Brujas of Brooklyn is, is anti-Dominican man because my father, may he rest in peace, was a Dominican man, had his own issues with machis machismo, but he allowed me to be born, right? But my brother, you know, my brothers, but especially my brother, my mother's son is an anomaly and exceptional with regards to breaking out of those gendered norms. You know, Miga's boyfriend, um, yes, he was uh, raised in the U.S. I mean, born in Puerto Rico, raised in the U.S. He's Dominican, but like also, you know, a, 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 a empath and very much about supporting Miga and all that she does. And they share the 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 chores of the house. So it's not like, oh, you, a ti te toca mal because you're a woman. You have to do more because you're a woman. So there are a lot of wonderful, beautiful Dominican men that are doing the work to reprogram themselves. So I want to shout them out. But unfortunately, generally speaking, our men, most of them are still in that thinking that, yes, there can't be two roosters in the hen house because they feel like they, they have to be the ones in control. So this is not a Dominican man bashing episode. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can only speak to our culture because that's, yeah. because that's what we were raised in. So, you know, if we're going to be 100%, like this is something that we saw. It's not that we're imagining or, you know, putting down right, Dominican right. man. It's, you know, it's something that we did. So changing the topic a little bit, what is shadow work? I know I mentioned it a lot. A lot of people might not know what it is. So can we give like, like, a, like a definition sort of of what it is, um, and then I can chime in about the work that I've done, and then we can you know bounce off of each other. Yeah. So um, it seems like shadow work has has gained popularity. I want to say like in the last five years or so, as far as its reach on social media, and it's this aspect of wellness and psychology that focuses on generally speaking the the so-called negative aspects of human psychology and relating to one another um things like fear and sadness and anger and more generally really focusing on looking at the way that trauma affects our brain affects the way that we emote or relate to one another and i know that historically car car carl jung which was like a student of, of, of Freud, he's the one that really put shadow work like on the map in the Western world because shadow work, if you look at like shamanic traditions in Mesoamerica and like, you know, cosmologies in Western Africa and parts of Asia, pre-colonial Asia, they were very much in tune with looking at the person as a whole being and understanding this is why I'm, one of my favorite symbols is the yin yang. I even have it tattooed on me, you know, the circle with half black, half white, but there's like a white dot in the black side and a black dot on the white side to, to really um, um, illustrate how you there's bad and good and there's good and bad. There's shadow and light and there's light and shadow. Um, so our, our people ancestrally have been doing this for millennia, but in the West, shadow work really gained popularity with Carl Jung looking at the way that our subconscious drives a lot of what we do. And within, you know, that glacier, the hundreds of feet below sea level, which is our subconscious, there's a lot of trauma that if it, if it remains unresolved, can literally run our lives. So shadow work is creating like a safe space, if you will with a therapist, with a licensed professional, with, you know, someone that that has been doing this type of work for a long time to then be safe enough to look at what, you know, sexual trauma may have done to the body or look at maybe what not growing up with a father did to the way we perceive ourselves as women, our body image, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, and my sister and I, more specifically as Brujas of Brooklyn, we do shadow work. 
um, in the context of like womb wellness. And that shit is not cute because it, there's a lot of tears. There's a lot of processing, but it's almost like making space by looking at the heavy emotions, acknowledging them so that they don't haunt you, if you will. And then when that space is made, you can then um, manifest the things that you desire in your life. Yeah, I, w- I want to touch on my experience with that with the with the series because first we did um a session to heal the father wound and then we did a session to heal the mother wound and then we did um kind of like it was like almost like reparenting we were we were forgiving ourselves right and it was it was ugly much better yes okay great (laughs) <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna count us back in. <laughs> oh my okay, god! Okay, three, two, one, and action. As usual, there's always some kind of <laughs> um, technical difficulty. So I was sharing my story of participating in these workshops with Miguel and Goody, and the work, the shadow work that I did. And okay, so. Let's backtrack a little. So before I went to those workshops, I had attended a full moon event with um, Fearless Leon, just Lane, who also listens to the Lane, podcast. Just Shout Lane. out to just Lane. Um, I went to like a full moon event with her and they brought people on. We were doing yoga. We were journaling and I had like a breakthrough. I started crying and I could not stop myself Aww. like so deep and there was an empath there and she like out of all the women that were there she like pointed to me and she was like she's gonna have a transformation that she's the one that is having the transformation right now and literally like after that I started attending the events with you girls and doing the work and going to therapy and all these other things. Like, actually, you know what? I had been going to therapy, but I hadn't really, like, like really pinpointed what it was that I needed to work on. And then after I went to that, I was like, yeah, I need to keep going. And it felt terrible because it's ugly. You know, you're crying, you're yes. swollen, <laughs> you're, you know, like, it, rethinking all these things that you went through and reevaluating your choices and looking at yourself kind of like, wow, this is why, you know, and it's, 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 it's not a good feeling like afterwards, you know, after a while, but in the moment it's dark. It's not, it's not like glitter and rainbows and, you know, (laughs) all these chakras and all the colors. No, it's not all that. It's very different. But once you do the work, and you can look at yourself without judgment, it transforms the way you love yourself. Because mm. once you're able to accept yourself as a whole person, not just the parts that you think are great, you know, it completely changes the way you treat yourself, how you love yourself, how you love other people. You start to look at your interactions with other people and and see how you can change your response to them because people are placed in your life and some people trigger you, but you don't necessarily, if you're not cognizant of why they trigger you, you keep repeating, you know, cause you keep getting those same lessons until you learn the lesson. So it's like, once you learn your triggers and your reactions to certain things and why, like the why of it, it it's easier to forgive yourself, you know, feel the feeling and kind of just move on from that. So I feel like that was one of the most important things. And then, you know, that workshop, the father one was, you know, it was tough, but the mother wound one was, mm. oh man, I remember I was like tears, boogers, journaling, um, doing the yoga. And then like afterwards, you know, I, I, I always remember your, you and Amiga always suggest, drinking a lot of water to rehydrate and kind of resting and just being with yourself. And I remember I used to take that to heart and it really did help a lot. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it, I'm really happy. Yeah. No, I'm happy to hear that you, you, you gained something from those experiences for real, for real. And then going, and then the, the best part for me is like being in community with women because the way mm -hmm. we're socialized as women is not to have a community necessarily. It's like, you know, you know, you got to be better than her and we're all competing for these men and, you know, whatever, like very catty kind of, and, and, and seeing how, you know, women can come together in that kind of space and be there for each other and nurture each other and mother each other is mm -hmm. so beautiful to, to see, because honestly, like when I grew up, we didn't really see that. I mean, I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw that. But, you know, besides like our family and even within the family, sometimes, you know, you can be kind of not you, but people can be kind of catty and con and content, like have contentious relationships among women instead of being supportive of each other and, and, and loving on each other, how how we need to be loved. No, my mother was my mother wasn't even specific with with women. She was just like, don't trust nobody. You know, like, un amigo un peso un bolsillo, yo soy tu amiga. Like, it was very much about don't trust anybody. So I'm with you in understanding that, you know, this is this is also part of the work about reclaiming sisterhood in a new way. And I love what you said about the way we've had to mother each other because I, as a doula and a mother, have learned to really expand my understanding of motherhood that, of course, Mothers are the people, the women who carry life and then birth and nurture and raise children. But mothers are also the aunts and the comadres mm -hmm. and the tias and the titis and the grandmas. You know, mothers could be a teacher that really scooped you out of the abyss and helped you get out, get out of like the dysfunctional environment that your school may be. I know that that was the case for me. You know, so I think that in expanding our notion of motherhood as Brujas of Brooklyn, we really have been able to understand that, like, when you nurture really trusting relationships with other women, you become mother mothers to each other. So mm -hmm. going back to Erika, Erika and I and her cousin Jennifer and, you know, two Debbies and, 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 and Damaris, like, my sister and I, we've known each other for over 20 years and we make it our business to stay in contact and see each other a few times a year because not only are those moments safe moments where we let our hair down and some of us may drink some of us may, may indulge in other vices but we also get to unpack a lot of stuff that we may have been carrying in a in a space that we may not necessarily feel like doing in therapy or in formal circles like a brujas of brooklyn or a fearless leon workshop so this is why sisterhood is so important. I mean, my, sis my sister says in Miguelina that, that sisterhood has saved her life. And that's mm -hmm. definitely not, not an understatement. But yes, going back to your point, shadow work is, it, it is ugly. It could get ugly. And, you know, people are like, yeah, the, the so-called work. And sometimes they see the end product because healing is not linear. Like you have, you have your moments where you peak and then your seasons where you're down yeah. and then you peak again and then you plateau and then you go backwards and you peak again. And then you, you know, you go back to the valley. But on, I think people, especially in the Western world, we focus on the peaks with the chakras, like you said, aligned and the lavender mm -hmm. fields and people in all white and smiling and chanting. <laughs> and that is very much part of the journey of wellness and healing. But in order to get those places where we're in all white and we're smiling and chanting, we had to have what are called the dark nights of the soul, which may be one night, which may be a season. For some people, it could be a year. For some people, it could be a decade. But the moments where you literally feel like you're being dragged on your ass to look at the shit in your life that is not working, but that will not stop working until you acknowledge it. Yes. And lastly, with regards to shadow work, one of the reasons why it's so difficult, and you mentioned it in regards to the mother wound, is because let's focus on the mother wound for an example. And that's what the mother wound is, and is, is an aspect of shadow work, where we look at the way our relationships with our mother or the main female caretaker in our life may have had detrimental qualities that affect us to this day. And that's hard for people because it leads or it it requires for us to look at our mothers and realize that, oh shit, they are human beings. 
They're human beings and they're flawed. And beyond that, some of the choices they made were shitty because they're human and they're going to be flawed just like we are. And the effects of that shitty choice affected me to the point where now I'm dealing with the effects of it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, shadow work is also very much about forgiveness because when you look at the so-called, you know, darker or uglier aspects of who we are, we have to be tender with them and we have to forgive ourselves and forgive our mother and our father and past lovers and siblings and whoever may have been responsible for that particular wound in our life. It's a beautiful journey and at the end of the day, it's not an end. It's not. A, it's not. We're not. We don't focus on the end goal. We focus on making the journey as pleasant as possible for mm -hmm. people. So I wanted to touch on that. Um, the forgiveness part. It's. Mm -hmm. You guys said something in one of the workshops, and they, if they knew better, they would have done better. Yes. They didn't know, so that that mm -hmm. that is that it. That was a key in the forgiveness part because it's easy to like hold on to resentment or you know you didn't do this for me or you know I didn't feel whatever it was that you didn't feel and you know whatever it is that you have you know these memories of your parents but if they would have known better they would have done better I know that a hundred percent because even mm -hmm. even if it wasn't the way that you received love they do love you you know and being able to forgive them is is key in like helping you forgive yourself for the choices that you made because we're not perfect we're human beings and we're here in this <laughs> 3d world <laughs> uh going through all this stuff that it's a shit show here you know what i'm saying but we we're doing the work to heal to be able to you know get to the place that we need to be to be our best highest selves and girl one thing that my sister and i speak on a lot is like and again because i feel like you and i resonate so much because it's almost like i i know your mother like you know my mother because they're both mm -hmm. women that come from campos is like if they mothered us the way that they mothered us can you imagine the way their mother mothered them yeah you know so i've i've learned to extend my mother more grace and to be more patient with her on her journey of her own journey of self-discovery and forgiveness to realize that migrating to a brand new country and raising children in this strange ass culture and still being able to have a semblance of yes. mental health that's stable enough for them to be able to like exist on a daily basis is very commendable for our mothers. Yes, they did such an amazing job. And let me tell you, I, I'm, I'm going to give like a, a small anecdote. So when my mom came here, she was a teacher in Dominican Republic. And um, when we came over, I was one and a half. My dad was a taxi driver. He used to work at night, you know, and dad wasn't around for a while. And I, when he wasn't around, she put on her big girl panties instead of crying and like being in the corner and like, you know, whatever, doing whatever she needed to do to survive. She decided to go back to school and get recertified to be a teacher here in the States. Wow. And that takes cojones because let me tell you something, back in the eighties, people were not as accepting of people that didn't speak English. You know, um, I remember she uh, told me a story about a nurse. She had just given birth to my brother and the nurse like talking crap because like she didn't speak English. She didn't understand what she was saying. And she remembers now what the nurse said. But in that moment, it was like, you know, she, she had just mm -hmm. finished birthing this child and you know, she, she experienced a microaggression from somebody. So, you know, them going through all of that and the culture, mm -hmm. like the culture, how it was in the eighties is a, a big thing, but, um, they really did as much as they could and they loved us and, you know, try to give us the best that they could with what they had, which wasn't much mm -hmm. at the time, you know, besides mm -hmm. el trabajo, the work that they did, you know, it wasn't as, as it's not as luxurious as, you know, the life that our kids have, you know? So mm. besides um the, what's next for Blue House of Brooklyn? I wanted to ask that because I know, you know, yeah. during the pandemic, it's changed a little bit. I know you guys do the, the sarna, which I participated in, I think a couple at the beginning, um, kind of, oh, 
how about you talk about a little bit about the Kundalini work and how that's important and then talk about what's coming up for Brujas of Brooklyn. Yeah, so the uh, I would say the root of the work that we do as Brujas of Brooklyn is Kundalini Yoga and Kundalini Yoga is a, is a technology that has existed for thousands of years. It was birthed in on the continent of Africa and it has really morphed into different variations. But the way we know it here in the West, it's, it's, a, it's a form of practicing yoga, focusing on breath and movement and chanting and meditation to assist the Kundalini energy to rise in our bodies. And what Kundalini energy is, is a feminine, a divine feminine maternal energy, which is said to be the energy that God used to birth itself and birth the universe and birth the earth and create us and create all living beings. So it's energy that lies within all of us. It just lies dormant because of many reasons, particularly trauma and stress and malnutrition, for example. So in nourishing ourselves both with food, but also with sunlight and water, practicing yoga, movement, chanting, breathing, we can help the energy to rise in our body. And what the Kundalini energy does when it really rises and integrates in our body, it allows us to, to be more creative and to birth because it's a birthing energy mm -hmm. to birth projects. You know, this podcast was birthed with Kundalini energy. We birth human beings, which is the highest vibration of Kundalini, but you can birth projects, relationships, the way we self-express. And with that, I think what's next for Brujas is, is I think we're going to continuously commit to offering sadness on a regular basis because more and more and more people have been joining and more and more people have been asking for these 40 day practices mm -hmm. in community that has really, really, really helped a lot of people. And um, we're currently getting our website revamped. So we're going to have a, a relaunch earlier in the year. And we're really focused on offering more services. So Brujas of Brooklyn do a lot more behind the scenes than we promote mm -hmm. because part of it is self-worth. Part of it is still the imposter syndrome, like not feeling like we're ready, but like we've done many house blessings. We've had a, a whole ass book club with a small intimate circle of women that have done the sadness before. You know, we've we, we do a lot of corporate wellness work with major companies, with their employees around wellness and mindfulness. Wow. So I think we're going to be doing more of that, of the corporate wellness, while also promoting more of the behind the scenes work that we've been doing for many years. And, and generally, we're going to continue to offer beautiful, safe spaces for all people, but particularly women of color to feel safe enough to come and be themselves and put their bags down literally and figuratively do some of the shadow work, get loved on, get mothered on and feel that their sexiness. Cause that's also something that is very important for me as a mother is to remain committed to my sexiness and sexiness is not just the red lipstick and the tight shirt, yes. right. And showing the cleavage cause sexiness exists on a spectrum, but throughout the entire spectrum is this belief that I am a sexual being. I couldn't have created my son if I, if I didn't have consensual, right? Adult, yes. you know, safe sex. But um, to really make sure that I stay in tune with what that sexuality and sensuality mean to me, I'm growing more and more in tune with my own version of sensuality and realizing that as a mother, it's very important that I fill my sensual cup up as a mother because I have to remember that I was a woman before I became a mother. Yes. That's also something that I'm, I'm happy we we touched on that um, because of our upbringing as Dominican women, but generally speaking, women of color, there's this belief that somehow being sexy in the very traditional, like tight clothes, makeup, cleavage, let's leave it at that. Like being sexy and being a mother are like anomalies and they don't exist side by side. Mm -hmm. When in reality, I feel, and a lot of women that I know will say that we feel even sexier after becoming a mother because we're like, damn, I did that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I made that, I carried that, I birthed that, I'm raising that, that being our children. And that leads us to feel even more confident, which is a very essential part of sexiness. Yeah, I feel like there, there's a lot of work that women need to do to kind of tap into that. And and it's funny because I was like, after I did the, the workshops, 
I, I, somebody asked me like, oh, so what did you do at this Kundalini yoga workshop? I was like, yeah, we, we did a lot of press work. We did some repetitive movements, but we also were twerking. And we twerked. <laughs> I'm like, and we That's twerked right. for a womb world. <laughs> so it's like, you know, yep. I feel like, when, oh, you're also a mommy chula, by the way, because we didn't mention that. But when, yeah. we, when we go to the events, it's like, you know, we, we let loose and kind of just reliving, like, the joy in the feminine, like being present in the moment and and feeling joy and, and that sense of community really helps to move that, that stagnant energy throughout your body. So, you know, I'm pro all that, all that jazz. I love, I love what you girls do and, and not girls, women. <laughs> I love what you women do. And um, it's just so essential and you guys are providing a resource and something that hasn't been seen before. And it's so beautiful to see it in black women of, you know, Latinx women. And, and it's just, I mean, even the work that you guys do about uh, the Afro Latina thing, that thing, like, I feel like you guys made it, not that you made it cool. You guys were like, Ever Latinas before it was cool. Like you guys were recognizing the flat, the fact that we are black as Dominicans and we come from a mix of cultures, but our culture is predominantly black. And you know, I know people are. There's gonna be, you know, the traditionalists that are gonna fight me, and that's okay. And 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 you don't, if they wanna not listen or unfollow, that's cool too. I, I don't need your listens, but what I'm saying is that that work that you guys do too to tap into our spirituality and and see ourselves not as these you know descendants of Spaniards, which is no Spanish person, like <laughs> um, you know descendants of Spaniards. That it, it, it's like it's like you guys do like a complete. It's like a full circle. I wanna I wanna say because like the the yoga practices plus the spiritual work. And everything is like improving the community in 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 all ways. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for that acknowledgement. And and you know, the Brujas of Brooklyn, we are because of our ancestors and those that came before us. And I remember, so I got my PhD in sociology and I did my dissertation, generally speaking, on like anti-blackness in Dominican Republic. So I read a lot and I went to DR a lot with that lens of looking at how blackness both appears and manifests and how it's denied in DR. Cause that's also an issue that we tend to see blackness microscopically or, or, or rather, um, one dimensionally as the way it shows up in the U S like very African American. And that is part of blackness, but blackness is very global. So being black in the U S is different mm -hmm. than being black in Ghana. Like it's different than being black in DR, but the major connection is that we are all African. We're all of African descent and there's pride in that. But I remember learning, you know, in my early twenties, starting my research that because the Island of, Quisqueya or Haiti, where DR and Haiti currently, you know, occupy the landmass, was the first place on this side of the world where Europeans set up like m a major colony mm -hmm. to export and import humans for the sake of like profit. That we then have to look at the fact that it was on that landmass that today is the Dominican Republic, where one of the first major slave uh, and uprisings taking place um, by enslaved people happened. So that resiliency and that need to affirm ourselves in the context of blackness lies very deep, deep, deep in Dominican blood. So we are just doing what our ancestors have been doing for hundreds of years. I think that now um, our generation has made it cooler right? In the sense that we've made it, um, we've politicized it, but we've also put swag on it to really mm -hmm. pinpoint the many aspects of Dominican culture that are Black, that are African, that we benefit from, that we love, our food, our music, our swag, because I've been around a lot of the world and there's Jamaica and DR are two countries that I feel like we just have like a very unique swag that I think for Dominicans, it absolutely comes from the fact that we are African or of African descent. But I'm happy that you kind of pointed out the many things and the many hats that we wear. Yes. And I think that what 2022 is asking for us to do is to integrate those things a little bit more. 
because me and Miguel are also professors, that is our full-time job. We can't really dedicate as much time to Brujas of Brooklyn as we'd like. So we are looking to slowly wean ourselves off of academia so that we can make Brujas of Brooklyn like our main our main baby because it is it is our baby right yeah. now. You guys birthed something amazing. And, you know, it's just, I, I really admire both of you for the work that you do and the fact that so. we're so connected. I love it. It's it's one of my favorite things. And it, it's one of my favorite stories about interconnectedness and, and how, not that the world is small, it's like, you know, you have this, what is it? What is the thing that you guys say? Like, you're like five connections away from somebody. So um, it's it's really interesting. And with that, I want to thank you, Giri, for being such an amazing guest and, and being so flexible and open and uh, so candid with your responses. And I'm going to end the episode saying what I always say, which is follow me at Comandre the Pod on IG and follow Giri on IG at Brujas of Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. Yes, B R U J A S, Brujas of Brooklyn with a J. Yes. And if you have any questions at all, if you want me to bring Gri back, if you want me to bring me get on, please send me a oh, comadregram. That'd, that'd be so much fun. <laughs> send me a comadregram at, um, at my email at comadrando at esethenetwork.com or via DM. And thank you for spending time with your comadres. All right. Thank you, sis. I appreciate it. And bless your podcast. And may it be fruitful and have many, 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 many episodes to come. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, good night, everyone. Bye.